Okay, uh, welcome to this um, session on, on the maps app. Uh, I've called it Extending DHS2 Maps, and it's basically about how you can make the functionality, add to the functionality of the application. So you can, how you can import and do analysis on data, which is not your own DHS2 data, and also how you can export data from the Maps app and then import it into other application for further analysis. Um, we'll have about an hour. I think we have plenty of time. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've now worked on the team here for uh, almost six years this autumn. Uh, I am the core developer of the Maps application. It's basically the only application I work on. But I've also made maps my my sort of my profession. So I have a master degree in maps or in GIS, uh, and I also work with several other uh, companies uh, to create maps uh, application. Uh, I really enjoyed working on DHS2 and also to see the the impact uh, the maps you create can have. So I'm delighted to to be here with you. Uh, as I said, we have plenty of time so please use the community of practice we will share the link yeah. um you alice will do it uh to the page so i i also encourage you to ask questions you might have about uh, the maps application which even is if it's not uh, directly related to the the topic today so please feel free to to ask questions and we'll take around at the end so what we will cover today is uh, an exciting new feature in uh, 236, uh, which is that you can combine data from something called Google Earth Engine. It can, for example, be population data. You can combine this data with your own organization units or facilities in your own distance, all, all from the within the, the Maps application. Then we'll, I will show you how easy you can download uh, your data from, from the Maps application and then import and visualize the same data in a tool called QGIS. And lastly, we will see how you can import external layers into DHS2 Maps. So you can have additional layers uh, in addition to what's already there. And you will even learn how to make your background this uh, painted watercolor look. Hopefully not useful. <laughs> you will use another maps for your the maps you produce with the health data, but it's a good as an example of how you can add your own base map uh, to the tool. So we'll start with the Google Earth engine layers. In the previous versions, we actually call these Google Earth engine layers, but it's a quite technical term that the end user don't really need to, to know about. So no, we name these layers by their topic. So these are currently the Google Earth Engines layers we have. So we have population, elevation, precipitation, temperature, and land cover. And today we have time to go through all of them and, and show, and I can show you how they can be used. So what is Google Earth Engine? Uh, it's uh, like come for good project that Google is having. So they are providing their infrastructure in the cloud and not only the capacity to store a lot of data, but also the computing power. So you can run analysis directly on this data and even combine it with your own data. And this is for free. So all the DHS2 users can use it for free. It's for free for non-commercial purposes. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to sign up for a Google Earth Engine account. And please note, this: the end user don't need to do it. Not every user of the Maps application. It only needs to be done one time per DHS2 implementation or DHS2 instance. So it's typically, typically a task for the DHS2 implementer to do this. It might be already done. We have had these layers around for, for some versions. So you could already check today if it's possible to, to add, for example, the, the elevation layer. So please check. And if you have trouble with this process, please ask us for, 
for assistance, but it should be be, and it's only a task you need to do do once, and then it it will it will work by itself. Uh, this is like a high level uh, sketch of how it works. It's a lot of things going on under the hood here, but this is I think what you need to know now. Uh, so basically, we have these uh, organizations which upload their data to the Google Earth engine. And then we have DHS2. And then in this version, we actually send, we can pass the organization units, these, these areas here, boundaries, uh, to the Google Earth engine. And then we can combine that with, for example, the data from WorldPop. So in return, we get two things. We get a map that shows the, the population density, but we also get a table where we have aggregated or counted the population within each, each uh, organization units you pass in. So I will demo this in a second. Uh, I'll start with uh, maybe the easiest layer, which is the elevation layer, which will tell you the height about sea level uh, for all of your, your, uh, your area or country. So I will switch to the Maps app. Uh, so by so to add this elevation layer, you simply click on add layer and then on elevation. And here you have the different way you could aggregate and he, and we the data, the elevation data. So we have tried here to make sensible defaults for each data set. So we think if you pass in some organization units, it could be nice to see the minimum maximum and the mean or average elevation for that uh, district. So this is by default, but you have, in addition, you can select more ways to aggregate this data. Uh, this is a new tab here for this layer. So now you can select the organization units where you want to aggregate the data. So by default, we select the first uh, the second level below below the national level. So we'll just go with the default and see, and to calculate the, the elevation for all the districts in Sierra Leone. And then style, we will come back to this one. So we skip, go with the default for now. And then we do add layer. You will see that it takes a little bit time, uh, more time maybe than before, because we are running these, these calculations and this is not done locally. We now send the organization units areas to the Google servers and then it's returned, but it should go, go fairly quick. And then you can now click on this individual and this is then calculated uh, when the data was returned. So you can see in this district, you can see just by looking at the map, you will see by the legend that it's a fairly low uh, elevation in this part of the country and then in the northeast it's a higher elevation we probably also have the the highest peak in sierra leone and if you click on it you will see the values calculated so within this uh, district the minimum elevation is uh, 72 meters and then the highest is 1933 so all of the country if i check this one as well all of the country is below 2000 meters. You can also right click anywhere on this map to get the value at that location. If I zoom in a bit and then I right click here and then you find, depending on the layer you have selected, but this is elevation, you can see show elevation. And then you will get the elevation at that exact location. So we can check over here where it looks like it's higher altitude, uh, show elevation, and there it's 1,600, almost 700 meters. Um, I checked, uh, so I found that the highest mountain in, in Sierra Leone, I didn't know, is the Mount Bintumani and which is 1,945 meters above sea level. 
uh, at the the elevation we got the max elevation was not exactly the same it was 12 meters below so 1933 and and you will get this this small uh, differences the, the main reason for this is that uh, we have elevation data for all over the world by 30 by 30 meters so for every 30 meter we have one value and if the peak for example is like a cone like this uh, that elevation value we have for the 30 by 30 meter is um, a mean value. So there might be small differences if you look up on Wikipedia and what is the really the, the highest point. It can be a few meters difference. I'll go back to the app and show one example. So one use of this elevation data could be to detect zones where there is a higher risk for vector-borne diseases or malaria, whether because maybe the mosquitoes live under a certain uh, altitude. Uh, for Sierra Leone, it's not a good example, but it's where I have the data uh, because the highest point is or everything is below 2000 meters. So the f all of the country is uh, there is a high risk for, for malaria disease. But I'll still use it as an example, but just so you know that this is only for, for demoing. So I will create a new, add the layer again, and then I will go to the style tab. So for example, let's say that below 400 meters, there's a high malaria risk. So we add that to the mean value. And then we could say that between four and 800 is a medium risk. And then above 800, it will be a, a low risk. And then we also reduce the number of steps here to make it easier to interpret. So we reduce it all the way to three. So we now only have these three classes before 400, 4 to 800, and above 800. And then also because higher elevation means higher risk, no, lower elevation means higher risk we will switch the, the color legend. So have a dark color. We use red at the bottom and then it gets brighter where it's less risk. And then we add a layer. So this you can do for all the Google Earth engine layers. You can easily change the legend. So it sort of fits the, the country where we are. And again, for demo purpose, the, the high risk areas would then be the one with the dark red. And then it's this zone here, uh, brighter, will have medium risk. And then there is only a few areas about 800 meters. So if I go back here, the, the true maps for Sierra Leone when it comes to malaria risk looks like this, all red. So this is only for demoing. We made we made this map. We had uh, me and Austin had a GIS Academy one and a half year ago in, in Delhi, where we made this more proper malaria map for countries where it actually actually counts. So the in for Bhutan, the malaria risk is below high risk is below 1700 meters. So here we have colorized these areas and uh, so this is not done. You cannot do this in the DHS2 maps, but you can use it in QGIS, which we will look at later. And this is also an example of what you can do also with this elevation data, is that you can colorize it uh, after the, the altitude. So you can have this color scale that sort of mimics the, the terrain a bit. So you have the snow-capped mountains and the greener valleys. Uh, so you can create more like a topography map uh, where that is important. So this is not something we'll cover now, but uh, we could cover that in, in a separate uh, academy. So then I'll move on to the population layers. Um, new in this version in 236 um, is that we have two population layers. So previously we only had the one showing total population. But then we now have added one that is divided into age groups. So these are in five years intervals and also cover both genders. So you can have uh, 
divide by, by sex. Um, and this was especially requested as it could be useful for uh, like a COVID uh, vaccination. So as, where you don't have good census data, you could have this, this as an estimate for, for where the, uh, how old the population or how the number of people in, in the different age groups. So I will demo these layers now. Create a new map and then add a population layer. Again, we have selected the aggregation methods we think are the most useful. So we have selected some uh, which will calculate a total number of people living, for example, in each of your district or organization units. And then we also have the mean and to understand the meaning of mean or average, you need to look at the unit below and that is people per hectare. So the resolution of this data set is by 100 by 100 meters. So for what every 100 and 100 meter, uh, there is an estimate of the number of people living there. And so the mean will be the mean people per hectare. And that will show you something about the, the population density in your districts. Um, for this layer, we have data back to, to 2000, so a 20 years period, but now I will go for the, for the latest. And select for organization units. Again, I will go with the default, the district level, and I will still have the default style. And then add this layer. So again, what's happening now is that we are uploading your organization unit boundaries only. Not, of your, not the rest of your data to the Google servers. And then it will return this map. So by looking at the map, you can see um, the darker red, the more people live. And then if you click on this, you can see that in this district, uh, there's an estimated population from for 270,000 people living. And the mean number of people, you can see this is the not very densely populated area. It's only 0 0.33 per hectare. Uh, about this data, these data are for WorldPop. Uh, I really recommend you to go on their website and read how they are created and their benefits and shortcomings. There is also on our YouTube channel um there is a presentation from the director uh, at WorldPop uh, from a seminar back in April we had uh, that you where we presenting the the data so please have a look at that uh, what I recommend to combine this uh, analysis population data with is to open the data table so if you click on the more actions button and then select show data table you will have a table view of the same data. And these you can sort. So by so clicking on the headers here, you can sort by the, by the population numbers. So now it's sorted in ascending order. Clicking once more, we'll sort it so we have the highest population at the top. And here you can also see that you can do the same with the mean population per, per hectare. So, and this is also a nice little new feature in 236. We added a, a hover effect. So if you're moving the mouse over the table, you will, the area will be highlighted. So it's more easy to, to identify the, the places on the map. So we will see that the Western area, this district has the highest population. And you can also see that from the map. Uh, where we have the free town, the capital. So 1,445,000 uh, live there. Another nice feature here is that you can, when you have this view, you don't have to go back uh, if you would like to see within this district, uh, what's the population counts there. You can just right click and then select drill down one level. This is the same feature we had for, for thematic layers already. So that will then load all the levels below, all the chiefdoms in this uh, district. 
And again, this table will automatically update it to find the area with the highest population. You can again, again click on this, or if we want to find the highest population density, we can we can click on the last column and and then over here. So this district has the highest population density. If we go further down, we will reach the facility level. And then as these are not these only points on our maps, these are the location of the health facilities. Uh, the, the way we can sort of aggregate data for each district is that we can draw a buffer around it and then calculate the population living within this buffer. So this buffer here is, four, is five kilometers. So within five kilometers, if I sort this, this has the highest population of 13,000. And then this one has the second highest. Uh, so this, um, you can change this value. So if I edit the layer and then you will see 5,000 here, you can, we can change this, reduce this to 3,000 and then click update. And you will have a little bit more space in between them, but then at the same time, you won't cover all the, the areas in your district, but you can try different values here and, and see the, the results. So this is the total population layer. I will then move on to the population by age and gender. So that is the, the second layer here. Let's add it. And here you will find another selection uh, of groups. So let's now see if we are going to check the people we would like to, to vaccinate, for example, and we will start with the, the elderly population. So let's say we would like to, to have an estimate of the population about 70 years in, in our districts. So then we select 70, all these three to have 70 and above. And then now I've selected the men and then we have the women. So let's do the same. So we have these six groups that we have selected together. And then we have the same aggregation method. So it's especially, we can skip mean for this. We only want to have the totals. Uh, if I add this layer, you will see that the map gets very bright because in Sierra Leone, it's a very few people uh, compared to the total population that is about 70 years. It, maybe if you switch the base map to a dark one, uh, these places where these people live, it's a, a more easy to see. What we could also do is to change the legend. So instead of having this from zero to 10, which might work for the whole population, we could see say that this goes only one, zero to one. Uh, and then the legend will be adjusted for the same number of steps. So we select update and it will run again. But now it should be a little bit more easy to see where these people are. So now it looks a little bit darker at least. So we have here, so if we click on the district again, uh, we have now combined all these groups together. So this shows that in the district of Port Lupu, the population about 70 years is estimated to be 10,787 uh, persons. Again, we can drill down one level And we now have the different districts. We can open the attribute table and then sort by the population. And we see that we have most in this district and the least 
uh, only 358 persons in, in this district. And again, you can go all the way to facility level and, and get the numbers around living around each uh, health facility. So that is the population layer. I think this is probably the one you will use the most and it's the most uh, useful. Uh, but I'll also demo the, the others that we have added. So there was a quick question, Bjorn. I don't know if you wanted to wait for questions until the end. No, that's fine. Uh, just a quick question about the years that are available for population data in particular. Will that are those fixed with the DHS2 version or will they be updated when new, ver new data is available? So uh, if you have an earlier version of DHS2, the, we don't have the same population layers as we have in the last version. So there, there is limited population data, I'm afraid. So, and we don't plan to backport uh, that. Uh, but if you, if you are on the latest version or, or upgrade to 236, you will have fairly recent data or from last year uh, for all over the world. Yeah, the, que the question was actually about um, if you're using 236 in 2022, will you see 2021 data? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, that is, that, yeah, that's a good thing with this setup is that uh, World Pop will then upload their new data and it will automatically be available on your instances. So yes, yes, it's the, as long as World Pop is, is still <laughs> alive and update, updating their data, they will also be available on, on DHS2. Awesome. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. So land cover. Uh, so land cover will show you the, the land use or, or, or the vegetation of your country or, or units. So we will add it. Uh, here is the land cover. Uh, the aggregation methods here are a little bit different. So here you can, you can uh, select how you want the data to be aggregated, either percentage of the total area of of your org units, or you can select in hectares or acres. So, but now I will go with the percentage and then period. Uh, this is the latest period uh, available to uh, 2019. Organization units still go with the districts. So this is like an official uh, um, land cover classification that is often used. So you will now have the response for Sierra Leone. And then if you click on, on, the, on these, you will actually have all of them listed, which are present in your org unit. And we have sorted them after uh, the, the highest value. So you will see in, in this district, or we can let's select another one, we will go for the Western area. You can see that almost 40% of this area is considered to be savanna, and then also 21% of, of woody savannas. And then the next category is 30%, which is considered to be urban or build up areas. And that's before for wetlands. So this can be useful. I'm not sure how useful it's regarded, related to, to health issues, but uh, can be good to, to get some data for, for each of your districts. Again, if you are, you can see the legend here, but it can be a little bit difficult to maybe get the correct color. So you can right click and say show land cover, and it will tell you what's at, at that area where you click. That's the land cover one. Let's move on to temperature and rainfall precipitation. Um, I'll start with precipitation. So I'm not sure how useful this is. We might need some extra work on this, but I will show you how it works right now. So the aggregation methods we suggest is to have the minimum, maximum, and mean precipitation for, for your org units. Uh, and this needs to be selected for a period. And this is collect, this data is available in five days periods. And this is an example of how things are automatically updated. 
we don't have data for it's not a, like a weather forecast or or it's not totally up to date so this one is updated once a month and then they will add the full month of data so the latest data available is for the end of may so we can select this week again we go with the default uh, levels So there are other data sets and some data sets are even like updated on an hourly basis. So we might try to have a look and see if we can for, find more up-to-date data, but we also need to know if, I know you can find this data in other, other sources. So, so we need to feedback of, of your requirements as well. So if I open the data table, we will see that the, the go to the mean rainfall you will see that we have the highest uh, rainfall. So this is like the mean rainfall within this five days period. And this is the maximum and minimum uh, within the org unit itself. So it shows that it's uh, more, has been more rain in the south than, than in the north. The last one I will show is the temperature layer. This has a little bit limitation because this is collected by using satellites. And this one is struggling when there is a, is a permanent cloud cover uh, of over the area. So during the rainy season, for example, it can be hard to, to, to get the data. So I'll just show an example. This one is newer. This is more frequently updated. So these are in eight days period, but you can see it's all the way up to the 18th of June last week. Uh, and then if we add a layer, you will soon see the, the challenges with this layer because it's the rainy season now in the African Mosun in, in Sierra Leone. So it's big areas where we don't have any data. Again, we need to look uh, closer to see if we can find some alternatives if these data sets are, are useful for you to have uh, on the platform. But just to show you an example, if you move outside the, the, the rainy season, so we go back to January and then update the map. You should have more uh, coverage of your country. So if you right click show temperature, you will see that uh, in this week, January to January 9, the average temperature were th almost 32 degrees during daytime. So that's the Google Earth Engine layers that we currently have. Uh, just so you know that this is just a tiny, tiny bit of what's available on Google Earth Engine. Uh, we might also, we have some plans that, that we would like to make a way that you can configure and add your own layers, but that will also be a higher technical barrier for, for your users. So if you know of some data set, you please have a look uh, on the link here. Um, and if there are some data sets you would like us to add, then, then please tell us and, and we can consider them to add them directly to the platform. Okay, uh, the next topic is how you can download the data. Uh, so if, if the Maps app is not having enough capabilities, uh, we have tried to cover most of your needs, but there might be some specific needs that, that you have. And then instead of, of making the Maps application super complex to, to, and also in, in the matter that we have limited development resources, uh, we have made it easier for you to, to download the data and then import it into other applications where you can, you can uh, do your analysis. So the four layers where we currently support download are thematic, events, facilities, and boundaries. And I'll just show you how easy we have done made this for you. So if I go back to the Maps app, I'll create a new and then add a boundary layer. I'll select the district level 
uh, again, add it. So here you have the boundaries. And if you want to download these boundaries, you click on this button and select download data. So this data will be downloaded in a format called GeoJSON, which is probably the most common uh, uh, format for, for geographic data uh, to use at least on the web. Uh, and is supported by all, all mapping and GIS applications out there, including QGIS and, and ArcGIS, if you are using that program. So click download. And then to show you how easy you can import the data is that I'm switching to QGIS and then having my download folder. So I can just drag this over here and then we have added uh, the layer to our map. You will see it's not looking the same uh, as here because this GeoJSON format is only keeping the raw data. It will not keep the style of your map. So you, you will need to style it again as you like here in this application. And this is not a course on QGIS, but I will just show you briefly. I double click on this uh, color symbol and then I click simple fill and I switch the field style to no brush. And then I click OK. And it, then it should look like the one we had in the Maps application. Uh, next, we can add some health facilities. Uh, so new layer, facilities, and then facility. We will style them by facility type. And we will select the facility level in organization units and then add. So these are all the health facilities we have in our demo instance for Sierra Leone. Again, to download, very easy, click the more actions and download data and download. And then switch to QGIS and open the download folder and just move the file over here. This one by default is just style by adding small dots to the map. Uh, if you want to style it differently, double click here. And then, uh, no, I didn't click the correct layer. I will click the facility layer. And then for example, you can decide to use a, like a hospital marker instead of these, uh, these uh, small dots. So I'll click on this symbol and okay and you will have this added to the maps. Um, yeah, I will not show the, the, the thematic layer, but you can also easily add a thematic layer and then upload it to QGIS. And then, and then it will also contain the values uh, for your map. So you can be able to style it for, for uh, the same purpose. I, I will spend time showing it. Uh, okay, so add a new thematic layer and select indicator. Let's select uh, malaria. Slept under a bed net last night. Period, last 12 months. Org units, let's select uh, chiefdom this time. And then style, we will go with the defaults. So, now I have added this layer, layer to the map and to download, same here, click here, download data and download. We move it over to QGIS. So here, as you see, all the colors from the maps are gone because this format only preserves the, the raw data. So it preserves the shape of your org unit, but the values are here. If you click on this identification tool, you can click on this one and you can see that there is a value and also the color we used in the maps application. So again, you can style it here, double click. I want, this is not a course on this, I will do it quickly, but I will select uh, graduated. Uh, styling and then select the value. And then we, I will classify the image. 
equal intervals. So you see, see here, you have the same possibilities as you have in the map tab and many more, uh, but it also makes it much more complex uh, to use. And then, okay. So you can now see this a different color range, but it's now style according to the slept under the bed net uh, indicator. Okay. Um, this is how uh, you, it works. So you can download GeoJSON and then upload to the application as you like. Uh, also, just to mention that now I, I didn't really show you how you could analyze and combine this data in QGIS. This is actually not possible to do within an hour. Uh, but we have a full day course in how to do this. So, so what we did, if, especially if, if you are not on 236, which I expect most of you, you are not yet on this version, and you would still like to use this great uh, WorldPop data and combine it to your org units. Um, with, there is a course on our YouTube channel, which will go through the steps of, of how you could do this. And it also adds something that we, we don't support in the map set, and that is to see the, the calculate the number of people living uh, within the walking or driving distance from a health facility and not all, always in a, uh, inside a buffer. Uh, this might be more relevant for, for the accessibility catchment area for your health facility. So please have a look at these videos if you would like to, to see how this is done. The last example I will have is to how you can add uh, import external layers, add additional data to the maths application. So I will, we will look at two different layers. One is for, the, for a base map. So this is, uh, it's called watercolor. So it will turn the base map into like a hand painted uh, world map. So not so useful. But, but it's a good example of, of how you can switch the base map. So often maybe you will have um, a national mapping provider maybe having their own detailed base map, or there might also be that you would like a special color, for example, on your base map. You have this possibility to, to add your own. And then the other we will add is a layer uh, showing uh, the clearance of forests of log, uh, yeah the forest loss within the last 20 years. And this is an example, not of a base map, but we call it an overlay, something we lie on top of our base maps. So I will show you both. And this external layers functionality is in the maintenance app. So I will open that app. So you do this again once for your instance, and then it will be, these layers will be available for all of your your users. So go into the maintenance app. <clears throat> you will find external layers at the bottom. So I will click plus. And then I will take the first, there are some URLs that I had. So I will add the, let me see. You can see these URLs here. So it's no good rule for how you find this URL. So uh, please ask an expert on this or ask us if you if you have some layers and you would like help to to add them but we will add the name so this is the watercolor base map so i call it watercolor this is a service is also we support different formats this with any mapping or gis expert will notice this is an xyz format and the reason is often you see, you will see this special X, Y set here in the URL. And then we will add some attribution. So this is from Stamen and it's also based on OpenStreetMap. And here you can select where you would like this layer to be added, either base map or as an overlay. So I will save this. So now we have a new watercolor layer here. And then we will, while we're here, add the other layer. So plus again, uh, this is called forest 
cover loss. And then I will copy the URL, which I have. This is also a XY set layer. And this is from an organization called Global Forest Watch. And then this one is not a base map, but it's something you can play place on top of other layers. What we also added here in 236 is that you can either link this to a predefined legend that you have on your system or link directly to an image uh, giving an, an, uh, an explanation of your layer. But now I just save it. And then if I reload the maps app, these two layers should now be available. So the base map layer is a bit hidden, but the, this one is showing the base maps. And if we scroll down, you will now see the new watercolor base map here. So if I add it, the map will turn into this beautiful, looks like a hand painting. Uh, and you will also see as you zoom in, so let's zoom into Oslo, you will see that it has still all the details available. You will have more and more roads and parks uh, and streets as you zoom in, but still with the same look. So, and here you could also, if I zoom all the way out again, you could see some of the other layers that this is, a, if you would like a layer that emphasizes the terrain, there is a terrain layer as an example. And also the one I showed earlier, uh, adding a dark base map, if you would like that as a, as a behind your, your health data. But to go back to the watercolor, uh, we will now look at uh, the other layer, and that is an overlay layer, and that is added up here, add layer. Uh, and then you will see the forest cover loss here. So if we add it, you will see the areas where the forest has been cleared in the last 20 years. This is calculated from satellite imagery, uh, showed in these uh, by these spots here. So we could change to this uh, bright to have it more visible or maybe better to combine it with a satellite imagery. So you can also see the, the intact forest uh, in between. So these are just <clears throat> two few two examples of what you can do with, with external layers. Uh, I see that I thought we had spent of time, but it's actually not so much time left. So, but we are almost finished. This is also an example of external layers. Uh, I made this for WHO, uh, where because if but the organics need to be properly defined uh, polygons, of, uh, but sometimes these boundaries are disputed. So this is a way to, to sort of add this overlay on top of your thematic maps to show, for example, disputed areas. So the summary, um, three ways you can extend the capability of the maps app. One thing is to use the, uh, the layers from the Google Earth engine and then combine it with your own org units. You can also export your data easily for further analysis in, in other programs. And you can add new base maps and what we call overlays with external layers. Ooh, uh, are there any questions? Hey, we are Scott here. There's actually been a ton of questions, very active in the chat. Um, and a few of us are trying to answer these as we go. Uh, thanks to uh, Sharajit and Austin and Phil for helping out. Um, there was one question that I thought would be good for you um, that none of us had to answer yet. Uh, Lucia Fernandez asks, have you tested the rendering speed in settings with low connection for the maps? And any idea how much it takes to load? And I think you were presenting at the time the, the new Google Earth Engine um, layers. And so maybe just a, a word from you on um, performance and any kind of uh, concerns you might have around performance or ways that people might optimize their, their performance. Mm. 
So uh, the problem, please test, but it, even on a low bandwidth connection, the speed should be, of course, it will take a little bit more time, but it, it, the, the most of the time we are waiting is to do these expensive cal calculations on the Google service. So the most of the waiting time is there not actually transferring the data. But it also depends, for example, if you have some very complex boundaries, and especially if you if you take your full country, I know Scott is sometimes <laughs> demoing this and taking all the facilities in in um, in Sierra, Sierra Leone, and then I get a little nervous. Uh, but in most of the time, it works. It takes just takes a, a bit of time. But of course, when you use these layers, just try to do it within one small district or just four or five health facilities in the beginning, and then check the speed of the performance before you. You take your whole country. I get nervous too, uh, <laughs> but, but but it's always worked. So uh, yeah, and then also we try. Uh, so we support something for for yeah. Now I think that's that should answer the question. Any more questions? Um, Lucia is also asking about uh, getting the data from Google Earth Engine that you that is available in the Maps app, and uh, is it possible to get that data into your DHS2 instance so that you can visualize it in other analytics charts, pivot tables, mm. etc.? So we have discussed in supporting this uh, and. We might in a future uh, uh, future version, and then it will be part probably be part of the import export app. So the reason we are not yet supporting this is that it's especially if you import uh, the population data and you use that for a denominator or for a lot of calculation for your indicators, it can have some big consequences that you might not be aware of by simply importing the data. So right now there is no direct import into the DHS2, but there is an, a plugin from ICT, I think, um, uh, on the app hub that actually is doing this. So, so please check out this, this, uh, this plugin. So that will allow you to import the data directly into a data element, and then you can, can use it all over in your, uh, in your instance. Thanks. I did post a link to that app, um, the WHO GEE app, Google Earth Engine mm -hmm. app, um, in the chat there if anyone wants to look at it. But just as you pointed out, it's not a functionality that we have available now, but we are looking into it. And we, we do have it on the tentative roadmap for the, for the next release mm -hmm. to have that as a native functionality in DHS2 to be able to import the data. Um, there's another question from Carla. Um, legends on the dashboard app. I noticed in the previous versions that it only displays when the mouth is on top of it. Is it possible to have the legend displayed on the top of the map? So just have the legend there all the time, I assume is. Yeah, uh, I think I can switch to the dashboard here so you can see the issue. So the question is right now, if you have the map, you will only see the legend when you hover it. So there is a, we could maybe make it into a configuration. The, there is a problem that these leg legends for maps often take a lot of space. Uh, so there is little room left for the maps while often for, the, for these uh, charts, it's, it can be much more compact. And all, especially also for maps, you can have three or four different layers. But um, yeah, we know about the issue and, and we could consider, and also if you have some good suggestions of how it can be, could be achieved, then please, please tell us. And just to point out, they were also planning for 237 to add that legend tab or that, that legend tile also to the pivot tables as well as the um, charts because we have legends and pivot tables and charts now mm. also. So kind of building from that. Um, so another suggestion from Lucia, um, Bjorn, maybe you could start bringing um, into the analytics with the climate and land cover data 
since that comes with less risk than the population data. Mm, true. Mm, good yeah, point. But, I know also that's also a reason for moving it into the import export app is to, to sort of hide this feature for the casual user. So it's something that you, you do uh, more with conscious. Right. Yeah, it's definitely a, an administrative function. It's not like we definitely don't want to allow just any map user to be able to import data. Uh, so it, it needs to be something that's tightly controlled within the mm. system. Mm which is, you know, our original plan was to actually have it in the maps app. And we had to, we had to back away from that because it, it, it was a potentially too dangerous to, to allow just anyone to be able to do that hmm. or for it to be available in the maps. App. Re relating to um, population in particular, there is a um, denominator um, session, I think tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I forget which one. Uh, Thursday, Thursday at two o'clock p.m. That might be of, of interest to anybody um, relating to population data and in actual calculations on the, like indicators in DHS too. Yeah. That one's going to be that session's not going to be terribly technical. I don't think it's going to be more around uh, like some use cases for from countries on how they've collected some population data, like going like doing like household enumerations manually kind of approaches. Um, no. uh, but I think on Friday, I, I will mention a little bit about our continued collaboration with uh, World Pop and Grid3, who are providing these, these, these population data. We're really, and I think Bjorn alluded to this, we're really right at the tip of the iceberg of what we can actually bring in. Uh, what you see demonstrated here is we're really just scratching the surface of what's possible. And uh, we would love to hear feedback from anyone and everyone who needs population data and uh, how they want to see that data, how that data could be useful or any other type of data. Because we really have the possibility to get like, say like individual facility catchment areas kind of data. Um, there are folks out there, World Pop Grid 3 specifically, who are, are doing that kind of work. Um, and so if anyone's out there who really needs super high granular um, data or household enumeration, population data, um, or has uh, any kind of requests like that, very happy to hear those. And um, like I said, we, 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 we have space. We can, we can try to work these kinds of things. We just need use cases and the community to tell us what they need. I think we are, need to end the session. It's just a few minutes left. Uh, please uh, continue to ask questions if you have on this uh, DSH2 community of practice. I will keep an eye on that one for the rest of the, the conference. Uh, and then thank you for, for taking part of this session. <laughs>